Welcome to the September Java User Group. It's a bit of a quiet, uh, quiet month with everybody at Java One in San Francisco. Um, just to remind everybody, we've got a Google Plus community, um, and we've got a, a mailing list that uh, we announce meetings on and occasionally have bouts of discussion, but not very often. Um, and we do record all of these meetings on video, and you can check them out on our site or on um, on Vimeo. So it's. Uh, it's worth a look, or you can send links to your friends if you think they should see it. And um, look at some news for this month. Uh, the excitement is Java 7 Update 40, which uh, includes some features from JRocket uh, with uh, Oracle acquiring that a couple years ago. They promised to roll in um, some of the cool monitoring features of JRocket into the mainline JDK, and they have. So Mission Control and Flight Recorder are available now. Um, which are some just really cool monitoring tools that keep track of VM status and um, I'd love to see a demo of that stuff because I've never used it. Uh, it looks really neat. I've just seen some screenshots, but that, that's all I know about it. Um, so if anybody's interested in talking about it, it'd be great. Um, they've added official support for Retina Display in Swing and JavaFX, so that, that works. Um, bunch of new JavaFX fixes and little new features. Um, new ARM binary. I guess they've been, uh, Oracle's been big on Raspberry Pi and getting everybody working with Java on embedded platforms and they've been supporting it really well so that's cool to see it coming out. And you know the usual, I don't know, there's like five pages worth of bug fixes. It was a massive bug fix release. So if you, if you get online and look at the release notes it's just crazy how many bugs and security holes and things like that they patched. Yeah, that's Flight Recorder. Yeah. So it, it records J, v, uh, JVM state for nice. a certain amount of time and I think JMX stuff and a whole bunch of, whole bunch of parameters. Um, this site that we like to show off and say how many days since the last known Java Zero Days seems to have stopped updating. The counter keeps going, but they haven't noticed that Update 40 came out. So uh, it's not really a good reference anymore. I think they patched the exploit that they were talking about on this site, but um, see, if they, see if they catch up. For conferences, Java 1 is on right now. Um, JFocus, I think, is over. Happened? I, I, not sure. Oh, JFocus is coming. Uh, what was the... There was another one that we just missed. Um, DevOx is selling out, so if you're thinking of going to DevOx, this is a good time to get your ticket. Um, usually sells out pretty quickly. Uh, tends to be a good value. It's a lot of fun. Um, I've been... Uh, Looking at Java 1 news a little bit, I haven't seen a lot of extreme exciting news, but um, Oracle reports that they're still working on platform integration between Java SE and Java ME and making Java SE lighter and making Java ME go away, essentially. Um, and they're all big on Java 8 and they hope it comes out and hope they keep their timeline. And um, They've open sourced Project Avatar, which was their uh, JavaScript backend, JavaScript hosting system, kind of like Node.js um, for web services and things like that. So if you're doing um, client heavy applications, it's probably worth a look. And there's a Glassfish roadmap update. Um, I'm still not really sure what's going on with Glassfish. They said there might be a 4.0.1 release with bug fixes if the community drives it. Um, and they're planning a 4.1 release in 2014. So it seems to be really, really slow, whatever's happening with Glassfish. What's Glassfish? Glassfish is Oracle's reference uh, Java EE server. Is it the reference implementation of Java EE 7? Or is there no I think it is the reference implementation. But they're trying to make it seem less like a real server, I think, or, or something. Um, so if anybody knows 
anything about the Glassfish roadmap? Anybody here follow it much or use Glassfish? No? Yeah, it, it just seems, seems a bit light. Like they released Glassfish 4 and they said, well, it, we left the clustering features in there, but we never tested them, so good luck. And they, they claim it's the first EE7 application server, but it's, it's not really a complete, I, I, I don't know what's going on with it. It's interesting, anyway. I'm, I'm curious to see what happens. Because they do have a commercial supported product. Like you can use Glassfish, you can buy support. There's not, not sure. Um, JDK developer preview is officially out. Um, they call it Milestone 8. It came out September 9th, and they want everybody who's a Java developer to start using it and start testing your apps on it and start looking for bugs and reporting them. And uh, just getting going on it. They don't want a slow adoption like Java 7 was. People still haven't adopted Java 7. Uh, but they want people to really get into Java 8. And it uh, looks pretty stable. I've, I've installed it personally on my work computer, and I've been developing against it. And no problems. I can't, I can't tell the difference. I haven't tried using lambdas or anything like that in my code, but just, just using it as the baseline JVM has been totally fine for me. Um, if you're a Tomcat user, this is kind of interesting. The core Tomcat people have started a commercial enterprise for Tomcat support and Tom EE. Um, it's uh, becoming a more popular application server. It's a little bit lighter than the uh, and the JBoss or the um, Glassfish, and it feels very Tomcat. So it's an interesting thing to check out if you're looking to get into EE, but you don't want to get into a huge application server. And you can buy commercial support for it now. And so far, they, they haven't said that they're going to do uh, an enterprise version and leave their open source one as a second class or anything like that. They're only selling support. So worth checking out. Da. That's, that's all I've got for this month. Anybody else? Any interesting Java news? Anything exciting? New arri releases? <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's been a lonely week for me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I'll uh, <coughs> hand it over to Dave and Starting the presentation. Okay. So uh, I'm Dave Mason. I've been teaching computer science at Ryerson for 30 some years. Uh, I've been programming in uh, millions of languages, well, dozens of languages at least, for uh, over 40 years. And my current research is actually dual phase. One is uh, this Java compiler, and the other is. Uh, project called Programming for the Rest of Us, uh, about trying to create a programming environment, uh, a flow-based programming environment for ordinary people. So today I'm going to talk about um, trying to make Big Iron run Java fast. So uh, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to compilers and compiler technology. I don't know what your background is, so I figured I'd better uh, go through that a bit. Uh, then I'll talk about code coagulation, which is the technology that this uses. And then I'll talk about the OptiJava compiler phases and how it does its job. So, uh, introduction. Uh, computing uses a huge percentage of the world's resources. Uh, maybe 10% of global power consumption, and that translates into a big chunk of carbon. Uh, Maybe 3% of global atmospheric carbon comes from uh, computing. These, this data is a little hard to nail down. Uh, this is an extrapolation from some EPA data a few years ago. Data centers, maybe about a third of that. So still a lot of power, and it's obviously growing as the cloud becomes more obvious. And much of that is running on JVMs, um, WebSphere, uh, JBoss, um, Tomcat and lots of other things on the server side and also on the client side. Um, and unlike many other languages that a lot of servers are running also, JVM and CLR have really good semantics and really clear definition of what 
how things are supposed to work, and that's good for optimization. And so any speed ups that we can do in producing faster Java programs helps not just the users, but also um, the environment. Nobody would complain about their computer running faster, but it also has uh, longer term impact. So I'm going to talk about styles of execution and workloads. If you want to stop me, if you have any questions at any point, feel free. Um, as I said, I'm not quite sure what the audience knows and doesn't know, so I'm if this is a little bit uh, al already known, uh, I apologize and I'll go through it quickly. But if I'm going through too quickly, feel free to ask questions because I, it's hard to judge the audience. Okay. Okay. So, um, upfront compilers. So these are the compilers that uh, I was using back when I started. It was the first form of compiler. It was uh, used in Fortran. That was the, the first high-level language. And also C and C++ um, mostly use uh, upfront compilers. That means that you take your source code, you feed it through a compiler, and you get uh, something executable at the other side. So it scans and parses the input language, uh, allocates memory, registers, however it's going to do it, uh, chooses instructions and produces a binary code specific to the particular architecture. Okay, I'm probably all familiar with this. Then this is linked to libraries and executed by the hardware. So the key point here is we take a high level language, or not so high level language in the case of some of these, and translate it into binaries that run on a particular uh, piece of hardware. Uh, in theory, this gives us the fastest code because uh, we can uh, make, we have lots of resources available at that upfront compile time, and we can apply those resources to do lots of, of cool optimizations. Uh, back in the early days, uh, this was really done because the computers were so small and so weak compared to uh, what we're familiar with today that you had to squeeze every little bit of uh, execution speed you could out of, the, out of the instructions and out of the language. So that's uh, when Fortran was created, that, this is what it was. And then when C came on this, the scene, again, it was an upfront compiler. Second style of execution is uh, source code interpreters. So a source code interpreter is conceptually, at least, the first form of interpreter. You read in uh, code, and it is, this applies to basic uh, APL and Ruby today. And when it reads the code in, all it really does is stores that source in a way in memory. Then when it comes to execute things, it goes to the appropriate line, scans, parses. Does everybody know what scanning and parsing mean? Yes? Okay. So it scans and parses that input line, figures out what it's supposed to do, does it, and then forgets about that. Forgets all the information it gained in that process and uh, goes to the next line and scans it, parses it, figure out what to do, and so on. Uh, Ruby and APL do this slightly more efficiently, but the original basic interpreters did literally that. That's why variable names in way back when were two characters, a, a, char a letter, uh, possibly followed by a number, because that made parsing really simple, scanning and parsing really simple. Problem is, of course, this is really slow, because it gets information, and then it forgets that information, and then when it needs it again, it refigures it out. And so this is uh, very slow. But it's good for really small machines because the, uh, the interpreter can be quite small, uh, especially for something like basic. The interpreters were very small. And it's also can be very interactive. You have all the source code there. You can keep track of exactly what's going on. You can show people what's happening in terms of the source of code. It's also good for small machines because the source code is generally uh, more compact than the machine code would be. And so this means that you, you can run larger programs on uh, small machines. Then we come to structural interpreters. Structural interpreters are actually, historically come before source code interpreters. So Java, or sorry, Lisp was a, um, a, what I would call a structural interpreter. And the idea is that we scan and parse the input into some internal data structure, an internal tree in the case of Lisp, 
And the parsing for Lisp was very easy. Uh, I suspect most of you have seen Lisp at some point in your life. And basically a, a start parenthesis has to have a matching right parenthesis. And parsing is really, really simple. And it just builds up an internal structure that corresponds directly to that. And then it interprets that internal structure. So that tree structure is what's interpreted. Uh, this makes it significantly, or can make it significantly faster. It's not very hard to leverage it into making it quite a bit faster than a source code interpreter. Uh, and, but it maintains the safety and interactivity of a source code interpreter. Because the, the data structure, you can turn around and turn it back into textual form very easily because the structure is the tree structure matches you know, source code structure and the internal structure are essentially one to one. So you can convert back and forth very easily. Um, generally, interpreters have much greater safety than compilers, particularly early compilers. And the same is certainly true today. You can write code in C that does uh, all manner of things. And the compiler doesn't actually help you at all. Whereas interpreters generally have been defined to have fairly safe semantics. So you can't cause a machine halt in most, um, in most interpreters. Uh, and structural interpreters maintain the interactivity because it can translate directly between internal form and external form. It's very easy to give good debugging messages and so on and so forth. And they're good enough in general that they're still um, in use today. If any of you use Emacs, um, the, almost everything you do in Emacs is driven by some Lisp code um, called eLisp, and it's still you know, highly performant and, and everybody's happy with it uh, 50 plus years later. However, for most purposes, so that works for Lisp because the internal form and the external form have a very direct map and it's easy to go back and forth. But for most languages, it's much more difficult to move back and forth. And so these other languages use bytecode interpreters. And a bytecode interpreter is an improvement over source code interpreters significantly. Uh, it was first, the first widely spread, or widespread use was in something called UCSD Pascal. Am I the only person that ever used UCSD? Of course I am. You're all, oh, no? OK. Um, I was going to say you're all too young, but uh, you just look incredibly young. Um, and so the idea here is that it does a scan, parse, semantic analysis, and generates bytecode, and that's a compiler phase. And then the executable is a sequence of bytecodes. Um, and the VM, in these cases, is uh, an interpreter, but it can be optimized very highly. So you can, you can build really good interpreters. They're usually stack-based, and the reason for this is that it's both easy to interpret and it's also very easy to compile to. So these systems compile to a stack-based inter inter internal code, and then that code is interpreted by an interpreter. What would the alternative be? Like, what would a non-stack-based be? Uh, you, people have built bytecode interpreters that are register-based, so they have a, so any of these have a defined virtual machine. So they define an architecture, and the architecture looks like what, what, whatever. So in the Java VM is defined to have a stack and a call stack, and, and there's only two registers, um, and that's sort of all that's defined in the architecture. Whereas people have defined uh, register-based interpreters uh, that where it allocates variables to registers and does register allocation just like a conventional architecture compiler. Um, they haven't taken off. They, they don't provide much advantage over a stack-based interpreter. And, uh, and, th and they're more work. The compiler is a lot harder to write. One of the reasons why the Java VM is so popular for creating programming languages, why there are, I don't know, 100 odd programming languages running on the JVM, is because it's really easy to generate stack-based code uh, from whatever source language you're looking at. Uh, and these can have good performance. They have compact executable files. Uh, the byte codes are usually defined in a very dense way. They're usually one byte codes for the most common things, sometimes two or three byte codes for less common things, and structured in a way that 
Uh, if you're familiar with the JVM, for example, if you're referencing the first, well, constants from, I think it's minus one to plus seven, are all single byte code. Pushing the constant three on the stack in the JVM is a single byte, because that's a very common thing to want to do. Um, comparing against zero is a single byte instruction, because it's a very common thing to do. If you want to compare with 3,812, you have to push the constant 3,812 3, on the stack and then do a different compare, so it takes more instructions. But these are optimized so that the most common things turn out to be really short, and that makes the executable files tend to be quite short as well. Um, and they still provide the safety, the security, and interactive environments. Um, the Java VM, unlike the Smalltalk VM and to some degree the USCSD Pascal VM, um, because the language is statically typed, the, uh, the virtual machine is also statically typed and so it has all sorts of, uh, at load time it can figure out all sorts of things about the executable code so that the, the VM can run even faster. In the Smalltalk VM, for example, if you're trying to compare uh, or if you're trying to add two things together, it has to look at the two things and see if they're both numbers and therefore it can, oh, it doesn't quite do that, but conceptually has to look at the two things and see if they're both numbers so it can actually add them. In the Java VM, because it's statically typed and the class files are also statically typed, it can figure that all out at load time when it loads the class file into the VM and then it can run at full speed. It just says, I'm going to do an integer add here. I know that the top two things on the stack are integers because it's already been type checked and so it can run faster. So that's one of the reasons why the JVM is so popular is that it not only is very compact and easy to compile to, but it's also really fast because of that static typing. I'm kind of mixed on static typing uh, in programming languages myself, but it certainly provides a big win here. So the, uh, particularly the JVM, but other um, compilers as well, including Smalltalk compiler uh, self, which is a version of Smalltalk, uh, was one of the first research projects relating to just-in-time compilers. The idea here is we have an extension of a compiler. So Hotspot you've all uh, heard of. There's a research project from IBM called Jikes RVM, and Self was a research project at, uh, at Sun. Uh, the idea is that you notice hot methods. So as the interpreter is running, it's keeping statistics about how things are being used, and it notices some hot methods. It then says, after a while, it says, oh, okay, well that method over there gets used a lot, so I'm willing to commit the resources to go and turn that into machine code. So it either fires off a thread or pauses execution, goes off, compiles that into machine code, um, and then continues executing. So it is quite a bit more complex to have a just-in-time compiler because you've got to make sure that the interface between the interpreted code and the compiled code is fairly seamless so that you don't lose, I mean the whole point of compiling a method to native code is that it'll run fast you don't want, when you call into that method, for there to be a whole bunch of overhead you have to do because you'll lose the, the value of having interpreted. Uh, so that you have to be fairly clever about that. In doing this compilation into native code, we can use information about the context to produce good code. So cell, for example, is it was a dynamically typed uh, language. It's uh, essentially small talk, a sort of super small talk. Uh, it's also an antecedent to uh, JavaScript. And uh, the, it was a, a, a just-in-time compiler, and it would actually look at how something was being used, and when it was going to compile it, it would say, well, this parameter is a, or this value is an integer, so I'm going to compile the code to run really fast if it's an integer, and if it's not an integer, I'll escape out and go to the interpreted code or go to an alternate version or whatever. So you can use information these compilers can use information about the context to produce um, uh, quite good code. Information that a, an upfront compiler wouldn't necessarily have. Okay, 
Um, the challenge is that you have a limited context. You don't know the whole program. You, are, you have limited time resources. You don't want to just stop your web server for two minutes while you go off and figure out the context about the whole uh, program so you can generate the optimal code. And you have sort of a local perspective. I'm going to compile this method. That said, if you have methods that have, for example, loops in them, it can compile those loops into very efficient machine code because it can figure out exactly what the situation is. So it can do a really good job on certain kinds of, uh, of methods and less well on others. So within a method, it can do really well. Between methods, not so good. It can do an okay job. It can reduce the overhead of calling another method, but uh, not necessarily that much versus the interpreter. As I said, the Java VM interpreter, because it knows the static type, uh, or the, because the instruction is applied to type values that are legal for it, that interpreter can be very small. The interpretive overhead uh, can be as little as one or two instructions on top of what actually has to be done. So you can basically, depending upon the architecture of the machine you're on, you can indirectly jump to code that's going to add those two instructions together and then jump back through to the next block of code rather than how you might think of an interpreter of having to load the next instruction, do a switch statement to figure out which it is, execute some code for it. Uh, you can often do much better than that in the JVM. So hotspot is certainly important. It, it has significant speed ups, but there's a sort of a limit on how much better it could be than Java. Whereas something like uh, self or uh, modern small talks uh, have just-in-time compilers as well, and they can actually translate to uh, a higher speed up because of the, the semantics of the language, because the interpreters aren't quite as fast. So now we come to the sort of most modern style compilers and the ones that I'm going to talk about today, which are feedback-directed compilers. So these are sort of a combination of upfront compilers. In other words, we're going to compile it separately like an upfront compiler does. We're going to generate binary executable code. But we're going to use context about the execution that um, like a just-in-time compiler would have. So the idea here is you compile the program and you include in the generated code uh, logic to calculate the frequency of edges. So when I go from Let's just see, do a simple example. When I call a method, I could have called perhaps three different methods. I keep track of which method I actually called, and I increment a count. So, uh, so at the end of the execution, I will have information about how frequently I called uh, you know, the, the method in this subclass versus the superclass or whatever. Okay. Then you run it on, so after you've compiled it and you've included this, um, this information gathering code, you then run it on a typical workload. And if you don't have a typical workload, then this doesn't work as well, but for most programs there is something resembling a typical workload, and I'll talk briefly about that later. And then you recompile it again, this time using the feedback information. So you now know that when I have a choice, when I'm compiling this call, and I determine that it went to the, me the method in class C more frequently than anything else, I will optimize it so that that call will work fastest at the expense of maybe doing slower if I called A or, a or B's version of that method. Okay, so that's the idea, is that when, when you have conditions in the code, you want to optimize it so that the high frequency paths through the code will be optimized at the expense of the less frequent ones. And we can make much more sen context sensitive decisions here because we now have a frequency uh, graph of how fast or how frequently every edge through the graph is executed and we have, it's an upfront compiler, so we're maybe willing to commit a couple of hours of compute time to optimizing that in some uh, grand sense. Uh, and we may be compiling with the whole program, or possibly almost the whole program. And so uh, we, we may have a lot of information about how the program works. 
You can also do it where you only do this on a small part of the program, but the real benefit comes if you have the whole uh, context available to you. Okay, so workloads. Um, there's lots of different kinds of Java workloads. Some of them are highly uh, variable. Interactive workloads particularly, uh, you might do this, you might do that, move around a lot. There's not perhaps going to be uh, really strong patterns in the, in the execution of the code. But even with those very variable ones, there'll still be uh, certain paths that are much more common than other paths. You go through a loop often or you don't go through that loop very much at all. Those would be typical kinds of things that you would determine. And we're particularly focusing on server workloads. We think that's where one of the big payoffs is for this, um, because partly because they have more stable workloads, especially if you're compiling the whole program. And the way we're compiling is essentially we're compiling everything down to native methods. So uh, the entire body of Java code that you have, we're looking at all of that, doing frequency information on all of that, and compiling sort of optimal over that, all of that. So it's really only at the edges where you make native calls that, um, that we're uh, falling back to, to conventional compilation techniques. And uh, so we, we believe that for uh, servers, we'll get uh, pretty good uh, stability. Okay, any questions about that sort of hopefully quick enough overview of com compilation techniques? I thought Hotspot did some of that, where it would integrate the server version and then the client version and as it went As far as I know, it doesn't do, well, it does it just in time. So uh, Hotspot will fire off a thread to do the optimization, so to compile, to do the just-in-time compilation. So in some sense, it doesn't consume resources, so you can continue executing, and then at some later date when it's compiled it, it can swap it into execution. Um, but you're still sort of bounded by how much resources you're not going to, you wouldn't get much benefit if you went off and spent an hour compiling it. So Hotspot's not gonna make that kind of global commit. Um, and what we're gonna end up with is no interpreter. So it will, uh, every instruction in the, in the whole body of code will be native instructions. And uh, that will, will give better performance virtually everywhere. Um, Sorry, excuse me. Is, is it like a zero sum? Like, how is not optimizing everything the right way to go? Like, you're only picking and choosing, right? I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, and I'll start to talk about it right here. So code generation is an NP-complete search problem. How many people don't know what NP-complete search problem means? Okay, so uh, have you heard of the traveling salesperson problem? Yes. Okay, you, you want to figure out the optimal path to visit a bunch of towns along a variable road. The only way to actually find the optimal path through those is to try every possible path. And so that's a definition of an NP-complete problem, that essentially the only way to figure out the optimum solution is to try every possible combination. And for code generation, the search space is unfathomably big. You'd have to decide, am I gonna put this instruction before this instruction? Am I gonna use this register for here? Or am I gonna use this register for here? The number of decisions you could make at every single point is huge, and the number of points is immense, like millions. So you would be looking at maybe there's 50 decisions you could make at each instruction, and you've got a million instructions, so that's 50 to the million possibilities that you'd have to search, which is clearly undoable. So the search space is impossible. So uh, what people do is they, they try and do better things. Um, so they do things like heuristics. So when a traditional compiler, when it sees that you have a, when it, actually when it sees a branch back, it assumes that the branch back will be taken. And so does the hardware. Modern hardware knows things like branches back mostly are taken, branches forward mostly aren't. Why is that? Well, it's, it's a heuristic. Branches back are usually back to the top of a loop. Branches forward are usually a branch around some conditional. 
but you can do other things. Uh, things like if you test for a value being equal to zero, or in, in fact equal in general, um, it's probably not taken because things aren't equal to a particular value very often. And uh, in particular, comparing with zero is often checking for a null pointer in C code, for example. And so most of the time, it's not going to be null. It's going to be something else. And so that case is almost always the wrong case to take. So there's various heuristics that people have built up, in compiler writers have built up, on how to make code optimal. Um, whoops. Something dropped. I guess not. OK. Uh, how to make things optimal in the face of this immense search space. But these heuristics are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. They mostly tend to be right, so mostly we, they produce better code, but not always. So the idea of code coagulation is to uh, generate uh, locally optimal code. Okay. So we'll, we'll look at little bits of, of code at a time. And little bits of code we can actually do generate optimum code. We can actually look at all the possibilities because we're maybe only looking at five instructions. So 50 of the five is a, is a doable number. We can make a decision around that. So we'll make locally optimal code. And then uh, and we'll do that based on the frequency feedback. So if we do that in the highest frequency spots, then when we come to lower frequency spots, we'll use less optimal code. So maybe in the high frequency stuff, we'll be able to do stuff entirely in registers. When we get to the lower frequency stuff, we have to store stuff in memory temporarily because there's not enough registers available. So the high frequency stuff we'll do, try and make it as fast as possible with the trade-off that we're willing to do slower code in the lower frequency edge or, or places of the code. And so the, the idea here is that by doing these locally optimal uh, things in the high frequency regions of the code and not caring too much about the low frequency edges, we'll produce globally something near optimal. But act, true optimal is, is just impossible to determine. Okay, so you get the basic idea. We're going to do the, the important parts first, the high frequency parts first, and make those run as fast as we can, and then let the, the chips fall where they may for the rest of it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about code coagulation, uh, flow analysis, basic blocks, and the exact details. So this is, uh, again, compiler 101 stuff. Um, flow analysis is to determine the data and control flow through the program. And this matters a lot for uh, programs. And control flow both inter-procedures, so from one procedure calling another procedure, and also intra-procedure within a, within a procedure. In some languages, like Fortran, uh, data flow analysis is really easy. The data flow is completely there in the static program. There's if statements, there's loops. You can look at the code and you can figure out exactly what the static flow uh, or what the flow structure is. In C, it's harder. Why is it harder? Well, because you have function pointers in C, at least in modern C. The early C, that was fine. It was like Fortran. But uh, as of, I don't know, 1980 or something, C's had function pointers. And as soon as you have function pointers, you can't depend as much on things. So anytime you use a function pointer, uh, what's going to be called becomes much harder to determine. Um, I have no idea what time I started. Do you know what time I started? Sorry? Started around Okay, so i am got to go quickly if we're going to get done in 40 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, but I don't want to bore everybody to tears either. So. so the problem is that in order to figure out where those function pointers are used, we have to figure out what the control flow graph, because the function pointers are data, and they're going to flow through the control flow graph. Like you're going to pass them to functions. But in order to figure out which functions are called, you have to know what the data flow graph looks like, because some of those values you're passing around are, are control flow, they're function pointers. 
So you need the data flow to get the control flow, and you need the control flow to get the data flow. So uh, that's just in C. In functional and object-oriented languages, it gets worse. In functional languages, we have closures. In object-oriented languages, we have objects, both of which carry uh, the potential of multiple dispatch. We could go to a variety of different places every time we call something. So that makes this much, much harder. Uh, static types constrain things a bit. So in a uh, language like Scheme or Lisp, or yeah, let's go with Scheme or Lisp, when you call a closure, it could go virtually anywhere because every method or every function in the system is a potential candidate. And so doing the flow analysis is quite tricky. In Java, when you dispatch, you can only possibly go to something with that name and this, that type signature. So you constrain somewhat the possible places that you could go. Um, so it helps a bit. It doesn't help a lot, but it helps a bit. Full flow analysis is undecidable. Um, that basically means it's way harder than NP complete. Okay, so don't worry about what undecidable means. <coughs> but hard. Okay, so that's flow analysis. So I'm going to talk briefly about basic blocks. Does everybody know what a basic block is? Yes, no? Anyway, it's a, a block of code with one entry, one exit. And there could be multiple entry points or multiple places that go to that entry point and multiple exits could go to different places. But, uh, but within that block of code, there are no branches out and there's no branches in. So this is uh, loops, the you know, body of a loop, if there's no conditionals within that loop, would be a basic block. The initialization for the loop would be another basic block and so on. Conditionals, the test is going to be part of a basic block. The then part will be part of a different block. The else part will be part of a different block. Method calls, when you, a method is going to be um, a block. So there are, when you call, that's the end of a block. So if you inside your if block, there's a call in there, that's going to end a basic block. And then there's another basic block that starts after it. Uh, when you return, that ends a basic block. Usually, at least in Java, it'll complain if that's not the structural end of a basic block too. But uh, that's the end of a basic block as well. And throws. And throws are the, the nasty, nasty part of Java because lots of stuff can throw an exception. And so every time you could dispatch on a method, there's a possible exception there. So that means that there is a, that that ends a block because it has to test to see if it's null. Then the actual call is a block. And then the return point is another, starts another block. So you have a block that's essentially just uh, uh, corral the um, parameters and call it. So you, you can end up with some very small basic blocks in Java. Um, it is what it is. So here's just a simple example. Um, of a simple method, declare a variable, uh, loop through, uh, check some conditionals, and then return a result. And here's the basic block structure for this. So we have a basic block for the initialization of J. We have a basic block for the start of the for loop. We have a basic block for the test for the end of the loop. Uh, we have a basic block, which is the test for the start of the if. And we have a basic block for the then part. We have, this is the else if, the then part, the else part. And they all come down to the auto increment at the end of the loop. And then that branches back up to the conditional. And the conditional at some point will branch out to the return. So I'll just step back and forth between those a couple times. So you can sort of see the, the basic block structure from the indentation, uh, but there's sort of more, more basic blocks in this than there are lines of code almost. Uh, and this is a simple one. It's all in integers, so there's, apart from uh, divide, and I didn't include the fact that if, if I was doing mod uh, a variable, I would have to check to see if that variable was zero 
and that would be another basic block. Um, because if it's zero, I have to throw a divide by zero exception. Okay, so this is a, a very simple example to show you how, how we translate basic blocks to and from code. Okay, does everybody have a pretty good understanding of what, what the basic blocks look like in this code and, and what they are in general? Okay, so code coagulation. Go through it in a little bit more detail. So let's assume we have the feedback information, the frequency information on all the edges in the, in the control flow graph. Then what we do is we go through the frequency table. We take all those edges, all those frequency counts, and we put that edge in a priority queue. Okay, so we have a priority queue, and each element in the priority queue is a frequency of an edge, and it has a source basic block and a destination basic block. That edge may represent a call, it may represent a conditional branch, it may represent an unconditional branch, it may be a return, it may be a throw. Any of those things could be uh, what that edge corresponds to. But we look at the whole program and we look at all these, frequent, all these edge frequencies. So if we have a call from some method ABC to some variable dot foo, that could go to three different places, in which case there's going to be three edges from that basic block, one to the th each of the three different places that implements foo. So we put these all in a priority queue. Okay, so everybody, know, everybody knows what a priority queue is, right? So then we can pull these values out and we'll get the highest frequency one at each stage. So we take the highest frequency edge out of this and we look at the two ends of it and we say, is, is this compiled code yet? Or is it still some sort of intermediate form? If it's an intermediate form, if they're both intermediate form, then we stick the two together, making whatever register conventions make it work most efficiently. Because this is the highest frequency edge that we haven't dealt with yet. We should make it as fast as possible, okay? So one of the things about a code coagulation compiler is all the standard ABIs about register conventions and so on go out the window. Just say, I don't care. I've got registers. I'm going to use them as much as I possibly can. Only when I call something that has, has to enforce the ABI, like I call some native method, then I have to shuffle things around so that it will work properly with it. But otherwise, there are no register conventions, okay? So I've got the full set of registers available, 16 in IA64 architecture, more in, uh, in decent architectures, three or something in the x86. Um, but I have a set of registers, more than three, five, six. Uh, I have a bunch of registers, and I can do whatever I want with those registers, and so I'll do the optimal thing to stick those two pieces together. And then I forget about it, because there's going to be more edges that point into or out of those nodes. Then I take the next highest frequency out. If the two ends are not previously compiled, I again stick them together and coagulate, turn it into register allocation and instructions as optimally as possible. Then I take the next highest priority and I keep doing this. Sooner or later I'll come across a piece where I'm taking an uncompiled piece that's connecting to a compiled piece because the compiled piece was previously put together and at the boundary, so I may be calling the beginning of it or I may be calling into the middle of it because there was a boundary in there um, where two blocks were stuck together. I adopt the register convention that that code already used, okay? Now, if this code's not compiled yet, probably I can do that fairly seamlessly. And then I forget about that one. I can take the next highest priority out. I keep doing this. Sooner or later, I run into a case where both edges are compiled code. So now I have a problem. They, they've got, both have register conventions already established. So what I have to do is I have to shuffle things so that this one can call this one. Okay, or this one can transfer to here, which may require renumbering the registers in this, or it may require saving registers or all sorts of other possibilities. Okay, so it's only when I hit those cases of these two pre-compiled pieces, or compiled to machine code pieces, 
do I have to mess with the uh, register conventions? And by definition, I'm at a lower frequency point now because the pieces that I already had were assembled at a higher frequency and therefore it was right that I made whatever register decisions I made there. I'm now at a lower frequency. I'm willing to take a hit of making less optimal choices. And if you have enough registers, probably you won't have to make you know, very suboptimal for a while. But eventually you'll get down to, to big chunks that are connecting together and you'll have to make uh, fairly arbitrary decisions. You're gonna save registers in memory and then reload them afterwards or whatever. But uh, we made a lot of cases without, ha or a lot of choices without having to do that. And in particular, things like calling a leaf method the leaf method has all the registers available if that's a high frequency edge because um, there's no register API. So I, I'm not sure whether you know about register APIs, but in the i86, for example, or i64, sorry, not i86, the x64 or AMD64 or whatever you want to call it has uh, 16 registers, but a certain number of those are supposed to be reserved for the caller of a method call and a certain number is supposed to be reserved for the callee of the call. So the callee is allowed to change any of the of the callee registers. So if it's a leaf method it can just mess with those registers but it can't touch the other half. And the caller is allowed to assume that the callee will not mess with the caller register, caller, callee save registers. And so what you've done is you've basically partitioned the register set in half. That doesn't sound so bad, except that if this method calls another method, then all of the registers that were, that it was allowed to mess with, now it has to save because whoever it's gonna call might mess with those registers, okay? So you end up with a lot of register saves, and that's the big win of this, is to get rid of a lot of that register saving and restoring, and make it so that you choose essentially the optimal register allocation at every stage with the full set of registers available at high frequency uh, edges. So we combine the nodes, um, as I already said, do that optimally. And so the, uh, one of the ways of describing this uh, in one of the early papers on this is if you think of a, a tray of jello and if you put ice cubes in, the, in, the, in a tray of warm jello while it's still liquid, it'll start to coalesce around the, the ice cubes. And it sort of gets firmer and firmer until it touches another one and then they figure out a way to work together and so on. So it sort of grows out from the hot spots of the code. Um, but when they collide, by definition we're at a lower frequency so we don't care if we do a uh, less optimal um, allocation. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the compiler itself and how the compiler works. So this compiler is a JVM compiler, not a Java compiler. So it takes class files and works with those. So it goes through and loads the class file. Um, and it loads just the needed methods. So you basically say, I want to load this class and so it goes and loads the main from that. And then anything that calls, it registers, as it's got to load that, and so on and so forth, and propagates out. So it loads the needed methods. Now what it does is, uh, within a basic block, you might have something like, uh, you, you have local variables, and you have operations, you have constants. All those get turned into a data flow graph and there are, uh, the way the compiler approaches it is everything gets generated into a register. And the local, local variables are actually just um, a register value that has, been, uh, that has been allocated. And so when you store something into a local variable, all that really does is says, okay, that local variable now refers to this register. So when it's done, there are no local variables and there's no memory allocated uh, as local variables. There are obviously objects, but there's no local variables. Everything is registers. So it's acting as if it's got an infinite number of registers. 
and it has just this, this data flow graph. And it creates a control flow graph between the basic blocks, methods, and handler blocks. Okay, so each, every basic block is connected to all the other basic blocks that it can possibly be connected to. Um, then it generates a conservative call graph. So what conservative means is when I have this call that calls foo of one int, essentially I have to determine all the possible foo of one ints that that could refer to. And the conservative way is I just take every foo that's accessible in any uh, class that I've instantiated and say that that's a possibility. I could be calling that. Uh, but I can do better than that if I know what the value is that I'm dispatching off, that will shrink it down to a class and its subclasses um, and so on. But I have to do this conservatively because uh, conservatively meaning I have to possibly include more possibilities than I would like to do because I can't prove that they're not possible. So unless I can prove that this can't be, I have to include it as a possibility. So that's what conservative means. So that's all the calls in the program. And then I generate a handle graph. And so the handle graph is everywhere I throw anywhere in the program, which are both your explicit throws, but also divide by zero and uh, null pointer exceptions and so on and so forth. Every throw in the system, I essentially want to know who's gonna catch it. So I, we, we use the call graph and we flow up the, the uh, catch information. So there's a try catch for these classes of exceptions here that calls this method and then it calls this other one uh, but it has its own try catch for some of the classes that are covered by this and so on up. So by the time I get to a method I know all of the possible handlers for all the possible classes of a throw. So that's what the conservative handle graph is. And it's bigger than you'd like it to be because there are cases that you can't figure out uh, that, well, you can't prove that you can't throw it there so you have to include it. Then we coagulate, go through the frequency information, stick all the pieces together, and then we uh, do a code generation. So the coagulate stage is where we do register allocation and then uh, code gen just translates the whatever add integer instruction into the architecture specific uh, add instruction and spits it out. So, um, just a general comment on optimization. Optimization, we have to preserve the functional programs of the program, okay? Functional properties of the program. So in other words, uh, we can't have the program optimized and non-optimized produce two different answers, okay? Clearly. Um, but what we want to do is we want to improve the non-functional properties of the program, uh, typically size and or speed. So we'd like to make a smaller program or we'd like to make a faster program. This is complicated by Java's pervasive exceptions. As I already said, there are exception possibilities everywhere. Um, but you can do things like discard un unexecuted code. So if you, there's a condition that you can prove is always true, then you don't have to generate any code for the else case. Or you can prove it's always false, you don't have to generate any code for the then case. And you might think that that's unlikely, but if people use code generation packages, um, that's not atypical to have happen. Uh, but ordinary Java compilers will sometimes do that. Uh, but, so let's talk a bit about these exceptions. So exceptions are this tricky thing in Java because it's part of the semantics of the program is that when you throw an exception, the whole stack all the way back to, who, to the main has to be there. Well, not necessarily. It only has to be there if you call print stack trace, get stack trace, or set stack trace. If you don't call those, you can't see that we didn't have the whole stack trace there. So we can do without it. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is a, a, a tricky little detail, and this is what compiler, compiler people are very tricky people. Um, but basically, if you can't observe it, it isn't there. 
and we're allowed to take it away. So if you can't execute that code, I can take it away. Um, because you can't prove that I did or didn't. Um, so if we know, for example, that there is no throw in this method that has a path to a handler that is going to care about stack trace, then I can do anything I want with the stack in between. Okay, I have to preserve the semantics, it has to execute the same, but I can do anything I want with the stack. So there's something called tail call elimination, which uh, CSP does, I don't think JVM does yet. Maybe eight does it, maybe nine will do it, 10 will do it, some, some version of JVM will do it. Uh, but th one of the problems with tail call, so tail call elimination basically means if, it, if I make calling something, some other method, and it's the last thing I do before I return, either because I'm returning the result of that, or it's void and I'm void and it's the last thing I do, then I don't actually have to keep track of all the stuff that I've got in my context, because all those local variables are never going to be accessed again. If I'm passing them as parameters, that's fine, because they're already parameters. I've already gathered up the parameters. But that means I can clear away that stack frame, which means I can make smaller stacks, which means I'm less likely to get stack overflows. This is where it gets a little tricky of whether that's observable or not. Like, you could run your program with my compiler if I do tail call of elimination, and you wouldn't get stack overflows where you would have gotten stack overflows before. Is that observable or not? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'm prepared to, uh, to take the hit and say I'm going to remove tail calls, uh, do tail call elimination if I can. But unless I know exactly where that throw is going, I can't do that. Because the default catcher does call print stack. Right? If you don't catch any exception, your program eventually falls back to the, the code that calls main, and there's a catcher in there that catches any, any throwable and calls print stack on it. So uh, it's only if I can prove that from this throw, there is something that's going to intercede and catch that, that, um, uh, that isn't going to call print, uh, stack trace, that I can safely remove uh, uh, do tail call elimination. Um, and we can also do short circuit exception handling. So if I know that this throw is going to go down four stack frames to this catch block, I can just reach into the stack, pull out the registers that I want, that I have to be restored to get the state back to where it was there, and I can jump direct, throw away the stack and jump directly to that uh, exception handler. Uh, so that's potentially a big win. Okay, just a couple more slides. So method calls. So there's, these are the two big optimizations. And they're where the frequency information um, is, is important. So uh, computer branches are huge performance hit on modern architectures. So a computer branch is either a switch or a virtual method dispatch. And the problem is that in modern architectures, they have huge pipelines. And those pipelines read instructions and decode them and turn them into some internal electron things that will run fast, right? But when you say load this memory location into a register and then call indirect to wherever that points to, the hardware says, oh my god, I have no idea where you're going. Okay, I can't do anything about your pipeline. I can't do anything about your pipeline. Okay, now we're branched. Oh, now I know where it is. Okay, now I can start reading ahead again, but that first instruction can't be executed until it's read ahead and turned into those electron thingies that those electrical engineers do use, right? So you've just hit a pipeline stall. And this is the biggest cost of object-oriented programming uh, on modern architectures is pipeline stalls. This is where C++ sometimes is higher performance than Java because people don't write object-oriented code in, in C++. They don't use virtual methods a lot of the time. And if you don't use a virtual method, you know exactly where the code's going. And life is easy. And you can turn it into a direct subroutine call. And the hardware knows how to do that. It knows, oh, that's a subroutine call. 
the pipeline has to continue being loaded over there and it will go and do it. But if it's a computed jump, a virtual dispatch, you lose it all. So that's one of the big things we want to do something about. Uh, so conditional and unconditional and direct subroutine calls are almost free because uh, the pipeline reader is way ahead. It sees a, an unconditional branch. It says, okay, I'm over there and continues reading. And that instruction just disappeared from the pipeline. It did, it's not in the pipeline at all. Conditional branches are a little bit trickier, but what it does is says, oh, okay, I don't know, you might go that way or this way, I'll follow the pipeline down both paths. And it might not be as far down the path as it would like, but modern ones are really tricky. If you branch back, they'll fill that pipeline up further than the other pipeline. So it has two pipelines that it'll fill at variable speeds. If you branch forward, it'll fill the non-branch pipeline further than the branch pipeline. So uh, these hardware people are, are you know, uh, so the software people are doing things and the hardware people are doing things and they're both trying to make it so that everything will work faster, but it's really tricky. Did you have a question or? No, okay. Uh, and so virtual method is via computed uh, branches and therefore it's uh, slow. So one of the nice things about this call graph is even though it's conservative, we may be able to determine that there's only one possible place you're going to call. If there's only one possible place you're going to call, then we're going to turn that virtual dispatch into a direct dispatch. And so uh, suddenly we just made that free. So we just bought like five machine site or machine instruction times because it doesn't have to fill that pipe or it can keep going with the pipeline. Um, or if it's a doubleton, if we know this is going to be either class A or class B, we can put in a, a conditional test and say, is this class A? And if it is, then branch to the A code, if not branch to the B code. And again, the pipeline reader can get up to that and say, okay, I don't know which way it's gonna go, but it's gonna go one of these ways and can keep the pipelines full or almost full. So uh, lastly, exception handling. So exception handling is sort of to handle exceptional situations. Um, and if you think of it as exceptional and something you only do very rarely, uh, it's okay if it's expensive. Nobody really cares. It only happens when your program's gonna die anyway, so who cares? But there are some algorithms that you can write that use, short, use uh, exceptions as short circuit evaluations. So if you're going searching in a big tree of data, you can, when you're way down here, you can throw a, I found it, exception, and catch it way back here, and short circuit all this stuff. Otherwise, you have to return a value, test to see if the value is found, return the value, test to see if it was, you know, all the way up. Whereas if I could just throw it, I could get a significant speed up in my code. Go to. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> long jump. <laughs> Well, well, this is where the culture and the compiler people sort of have to figure things out. Because if the culture says you only use exceptions for exceptional circumstances, then the compiler people say, okay, well, we can make that really expensive. But if I turn around and say, well, I've made this so it's really cheap, then you can say, well, maybe it's okay to use this then because I was partly not doing it because it was really expensive, and I was partly doing it for philosophical reasons, but maybe the philosophical reasons aren't so sound. You can, <laughs> you can have whatever negotiation in your head you want, but, um, but regardless, uh, if, you want, if you want to people to use exceptions uh, richly, I mean, if, you, if all you're doing exceptions for is to have the system default catcher there to catch any handle or any throwable, and print out a stack trace, fine. But if you want to actually use these things actively in your code, um, then you don't want them to be expensive, right? So you can go various ways on it. Uh, so as I said, it's very convenient, even though I misspell convenient for some algorithms. Um, and there's sort of two ways to do this. You can make try really expensive, 
or you can make throw really expensive. Um, and the before there was Java, there was C, and in C you used long set jump, long jump. And that was very efficient to jump back, but it was pretty inefficient to set it up because it basically saved all the registers into a data structure, and then when you did the throw, it reloaded them out of there and, and returned there. Uh, so try was expensive, but throw was cheap. Um, in the Java world and the C++ world, there's something called zero cost uh, exceptions where the try doesn't cost anything, the try doesn't actually establish anything. When you throw it, it basically traipses back through the stack, figuring out where you were, looks up in some tables, figures out, well, that's line such and such of such and such a method. Restore back, restore back, restore back, restore back. So it has to navigate through the stack, build up the whole stack trace, and then it can say, okay, now I can try and find, now I can return this to a throw location in my caller, and it can handle it in some appropriate way all the way up, really painful. But if we know that you're not going to access the stack trace, we don't have to build up. We don't have to traipse through it and figure out the whole stack trace in the first place. And we may be able to short circuit. If, it, if you've got recursive algorithms, we can't short circuit over theirs, but we can short circuit to the recursive calls. And then we can unroll those a step at a time until we're back to a clear spot, and then we can skip down again. So there's various things we can do. Um, so if we know exactly where every throw can land, we can look at, does the code from that point ever call a stack trace? And if it doesn't, then I can safely uh, not bother to create it. Because you can't observe that I didn't create it. Uh, so otherwise, if, if I know that I'm here and I'm going to go back to this handler here, I can just reach into the stack, load the appropriate registers, clean up the stack, and jump back to that code and make it very fast. Okay, summary. Uh, so I introduced and talked about various kinds of compilation and, and runtime uh, ideas. Uh, talked about code coagulation and talked sort of about how our compiler actually works. So you could help. I'm looking for server applications, not necessarily today because the compiler is a work in progress at the moment, but I'm, look, I'm going to be looking for people with servers with fairly static loads that we can actually run this on, production-like uh, environments, and see what kind of performance we might get. Um, the code coagulation, there, there was a, in the, so, compiler hardware world is a strange thing. Things things become important and not important depending upon how the economics and performance of memory versus processors versus multi-cores versus whatever. As this landscape constantly shifts, certain things become important and then they become not important and so on and so forth. Um, so there was a, a bunch of research in the 90s on feedback-directed compilers. Nobody's been doing it recently. Code coagulation uh, itself has been, there have been exactly two academic papers, one in 1974 and one in 1987, I think, um, doing this. They were both C compilers, and they saw 20% improvement um, in execution time. Uh, Java has the potential to do much better, uh, especially now that we've figured out a way to keep track, or to figure out all these exception handlers, uh, because Java semantics are a lot clearer. So C compilers, there's lots of times that you have to just say, I don't know, they're doing something. I have to generate conservative code because I can't figure out what they're doing. Whereas in Java, I can always figure out what you're doing I can, you know, within a fairly large band of, of any, always. Uh, and so I can figure out what you're doing and what's safe to do and what's not safe to do. So I think we might see significantly better performance improvements even than that. So my idea, and this is pure speculation at this point, is maybe 30% improvement in compute time. If we could actually make this happen for all those Java servers out there, we might be looking at like a half a percent cut in car carbon uh, load for the planet. And half a percent isn't 
a solution, but it's a bigger step than our governments are doing. Um, so, so we're really interested in the server market, but we also think that fairly dynamic workloads will, will benefit as well. And that's all I have to say. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry if it went on too long. And if anybody has more questions, I'd be happy to answer them either now or while I drink a beer or whatever. So, no questions? You have a, a J, you're building a JVM? No, I'm, I'm compiling. So, I load a class file just like the JVM would, although I don't do the, the type checking, so I trust that you've already loaded it into a Java compiler and it's safe. But I load it in and I build an internal data structure that represents the computation you want to do, and then I optimize it, and then I turn it into machine code. So there's no interpreter, there's no JVM in, in any formal sense. There's a, there's a virtual JVM, but <laughs> if you want to get double virtual on us, but, um, but there's, no, there's no classical JVM that's going to loop through things and so on. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So the idea is, I mean, if you think of it, if you've got a, a web server or something, you could run it for a day, let's say, gather the frequency information, recompile it with that known information, but keep the frequency generation in it. Now run it for a week, do it again, and now you probably have good enough data that you could probably just recompile it, leave out the frequency count information, because frequency counting information uses up registers, so you're not going to get as optimal code. So leave out the frequency counting information, and now you should get something that, unless your workload changes significantly, is going to run significantly faster than what, you've, what you're doing now. And can you write a JVM to automate that somehow? Or do you Sorry? Like, can you run that as, as one process that would, would handle that for you? Or do you sort of need to do the, the incremental I've been doing this for 40 years, so I tend to think in terms of you'd run it, and you'd take the output file, and then you'd recompile it, and so on, but uh, you probably could automate it. Yeah. So I, I didn't, the one thing I didn't understand is like, the, the code is compiled initially, right? Yep. And then do you exercise the code in real life? And yes. Metrics? Yeah, you run it under as real a workload as you possibly can get. Okay. So that's why I say if you have a, a server, you compile it yeah. with the metric gathering code in it, then you run your server for a day or a week so or whatever. What actually ch happens. Now, just because you have a zero frequency count doesn't mean I cannot generate, like I can throw that edge away. Because it might be that you just didn't happen to hit that case. So I can't throw it away, but I can make it really expensive. <laughs> like I, I don't care how, how well this does, because in a week you never hit it. So you're not going to hit it very often in the future, probably. And so. I mean, if you think of what a, you know, a, a web server does, it receives, uh, it receives a, a HTTP request, it parses that HTTP request, it dispatches to some code to handle it, and then it gets it back, creates a reply, and formats a, an output image. I mean, all that code happens thousands or millions of times a day on a typical server. Now, what the, it actually does with the page, that'll be different. So I don't care what the frequency data looks like for that very much. What I care about is that, that main loop of what that web server is doing. Yeah? So all of this optimized code is running outside of the JVM? Yeah. How do you yeah. handle things like uh, garbage collection, for example? Well, there's a garbage collector built in. So the garbage collector, actually, uh, we're using the MMTK garbage collector, uh, which is written in Java. And so uh, that gets compiled in just like everything else does. So if the garbage collector gets hit a lot, then it's going to have some very high frequency loops in it, and they'll be optimized. <laughs> if you have something that almost never generates garbage, so your garbage collector never runs, then I don't care how fast it runs, I'm going to optimize the other stuff. Yep? What, uh, what stage are you at? <sighs> uh, we are loading JVM code uh, properly. We have, we're building uh, some of the, well, the, the conservative call graph, for example. I have a grad student right now who's working on the, the um, 
exception handler uh, graph. I'm working on the code coagulation and, um, and then, so we're hoping that we might actually be able to compile real but small programs um, in maybe January. Yep. Do you run into any problems with the invoke dynamic construction? Invoke dynamic is going to be a challenge, certainly. But what we'll do with those is, uh, is we'll include an interpreter. And then if you use the invoke dynamic a lot, then the loops in the interpreter will get highly optimized. <laughs> and if you don't, then they won't. I mean, that's the sort of the, the, the joy of this is I don't care what your workload looks like. I'll, whatever it is, I'll make it look good. That's the. Have you done any work with a ZOS uh, architecture? Uh, no, I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, uh, I, I have a colleague who has, has a fair amount of in, uh, experience with ZOS, so I'm interested in this. I tried to get IBM interested in, in the project, but I didn't ask the right people at the right time the right questions, I guess. So. Um, but yeah, I think I think it would be a great thing for them to be uh, for them to be looking at because you know then you could have this big mass of of uh, big iron running Java significantly faster. Are you planning on targeting um, direct to machine code or something like LLVM or an intermediate language? Or no, this is direct to machine code. Um, the problem is that LLVM has its own idea of what optimizations look like. Uh, so and it'll, it'll mess up the optimizations we've already put all of our effort into doing. I'll we'll so. take this and put it back into byte code, Java bytecode even. You could do some of the parts of what we're doing you could you could put back in Java bytecode, but um, a lot of the other things, the big win with code coagulation is that you get rid of the ABI uh, register conventions. So you get rid of the interpreter loop and you get rid of the, the ABI register conventions. And so what that means is that instead of typically having half your registers available in the leaf method and half of them available, plus you have to save them and restore them in a non-leaf non method, you get all the registers available in the places where it matters. And so the expectation is that you that will produce significantly better code because of the, because registers are, I mean memory, uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in this right now, is that memory has become another bottleneck. So everything I can move, keep in registers so this is what I mean about this shifting landscape. There was a while when memory was getting really fast compared to processors, and so um, it didn't matter that much. But now it's back like this, so now everything you can keep in registers versus memory is a big win. Yeah, uh, you mentioned how, uh, how it's easier to do these kinds of optimizations with Java, but how feasible would what you're doing, like how feasible would it be to try with another language like um, any, uh, I think it would be reasonable to do with any um, any semantically clean language. In other words, not C, not C++, but any decent language. Um, so I think you could certainly do it with uh, with Python or Ruby or something like that. The the challenges with uh, those uh, Python, Ruby, Smalltalk. Um, I have a bit of a soft, soft spot for small talk, but any of those, the problem is that they're dynamic dispatch, or sorry, they're dynamically typed. And one of the big wins with using the JVM is that you have statically typed for most operations. And that means that you can generate, uh, you know, direct machine instructions to add these two things together and you know they're integers and you don't have to mess with it. Whereas in small talk, it could be a small int, or it could be a big int, and I have to dispatch differently. So if I've understood you vaguely correctly, it would be in, in a non-statically type language, it would have like a larger conservative call graph, like a bad phase. You would have a larger, larger call graph, and the, um, and the dispatch would be more expensive in general, because you'd have to, when you're doing a, well, I mean, in, in Smalltalk or Ruby, uh, when you add something, you're really sending a plus message to an object. And 
So that has to be optimized in some way. Um, the, the other challenge is that uh, this is primarily oriented towards large static code bases. So if you're constantly loading things dynamically, like the Ruby on Rails insanity, um, then you um, then you, you've lost a lot of the potential value of it. Uh, I do have a, a company that's using JRuby, and I'm hoping that we could use this with JRuby. Um, and again, except for the dynamic dispatch part, it should, you know, the, the body of your code is going to be not dynamic dispatch. Dynamic dispatch is going to be a little bit of it. And so it should get pretty good results, I think. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.